Hi everyone and welcome to this Australian Society of Archivists webinar on out of home care records. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country across Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Kirsten and I are presenting from the lands of the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nations, Frank is presenting from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and Simon will be presenting from the lands of the Ghana people. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Just to remind everyone, this session is being recorded and we will have a Q&A session for the last 15 minutes. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar. So now to introduce who we are, I'm Nicola Laurent. I'm the Vice President of the Australian Society of Archivists and a senior project archivist on the Find and Connect web resource at the University of Melbourne. Alongside Kirsten Wright, Program Manager of the Find and Connect web resource, we are the content creators for the ASA's new online course, the Out of Home Care Records Toolkit. Joining us is Frank Golding, OAM, Vice President of Care Leavers Australasia Network, also known as CLAN, and an Honorary Research Fellow at Federation University. Now, hopefully concluding our panel, um, he's having some technical difficulties at the moment, will be Simon Frood, the Director of State Records of South Australia, and also a member of the Council of Australasian Archives and Records Authorities, known as CARA. The webinar relates to the newly released online course, Out of Home Care Records Toolkit, that has been developed by the ASA and CARA and is now available on the ASA website. So I'll hand over to Kirsten to get the conversation started. Hi everyone, it's really nice to join you all today. Um, so in this session, we're going to be having a panel discussion based around some key topics around the records of out of home care. Um, that'll take around 35, 40 minutes. Um, then we'll provide some information about the toolkit that Nicola's mentioned before moving into questions and answers for the last 15 minutes. Um, as Nicola said, um, please feel free to submit your questions throughout the webinar. Um, don't, you don't need to wait till the end. Um, if we do run out of time and we don't get to all the questions, we'll, we can, we'll respond after the webinar's done. Um, and yeah, hopefully Simon is able to join us, um, but we will carry on. I'm sure there will be plenty to talk about, um, yeah, even if he's not able to join us. Um, so we might start by defining what we mean when we talk about the records of out-of-home care. So Frank, I wonder if you can start us off by sort of providing a bit of overview, a bit of an overview around, yeah, what what records are we talking about when we when we talk about records of yeah. yeah, thanks very much, and and um, hello to everybody out there. Um, yes, there are two types of records that uh, the ISA has identified, uh, interestingly, and uh, we can take a starting point from there. There are personal records made about a child, uh, the case files and and uh, correspondence about that child, and and so on. And then there are administrative records made for the purposes of the people looking after the children. Um, the ASA thinks that uh, uh, we, it's important to distinguish between those two um, because uh, um, the question of ownership, which I hope we'll get to talk about later on, uh, I think is bound up in that, that question of why records are made and, and what their nature is. The Find and Connect website is one of the most interesting, <laughs> uh, one of the most interesting pages for me as a list of 25 different types of records. Um, and some of those relate to uh, the personal uh, information about the, ch the child and their progress through care and why they're in care and so on. Um, but uh, others are um, clearly more administrative, but I actually think the more we look at those administrative records, the more possibilities there are for actually seeing the potential for finding personal information in them about children. And there have been some recent examples where people have looked at the superintendent's diaries, for example, or, or correspondence from a home to uh, uh, the Department of uh, Child Welfare or whatever it was called in those days, uh, and, and children's names are mentioned and details of personal information about them are mentioned. So I think uh, while it's useful to look at the two types of records, I, I think we should avoid 
kind of keeping them separate. Um, much better to bring them together. So that's mm. the sort of uh, records. Do you want me to talk about why they, they matter? Yes, absolutely. Excellent segue into the next issue. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, I, I would start by just looking at uh, normal families, uh, inverted commas normal. Um, I, I've got one of my own. Uh, I've raised four children. Um, and I, I think about the, the kind of uh, connections that uh, my children have with my family. And I'd ask uh, people who are uh, participating in this uh, webinar to think about their own situation. We, we all have a kind of uh, bond or family uh, connection or identity, uh, which is uh, we're capable of going back several generations in most cases. But you find the, the bonds uh, documented in family documents, scrapbooks, photo albums, mementos found in shoe boxes, under beds, in the, in the, in the garage and so on. Um, they're the memories and experiences that, that people have. There are also uh, things like Christmas presents that are handed to you by your grandparents and um, um, certificates from school and scouts and so on. These are the things that we, we hang on to because they are important to us. They identify where we belong. And when we go to school, uh, we come home and we're somebody's son or daughter. Uh, when grandma sits around the dinner table, uh, you know, we don't necessarily have to talk about family, but we know our we know our place in the world in that sense. Now, the point about uh, that long-winded sort of introduction to normality <laughs> is that that's not the situation for people who grew up in out-of-home care. They don't have that kind of thing. Uh, they, their families have been fractured. They don't collect uh, personal items in that same sense. They don't have Christmas presents from parents and the like. So there's a kind of generational uh, uh, loss there. And uh, if I can quote from one of uh, our members uh, who told the Senate committee, our entire family was ripped apart and we can never get back together. They split me away from my one week old brother and we never knew each other until we were old. I had cousins in St. Aidan's and the nuns never told me. I never knew my family. How can you get back together when you don't know each other? And, and that's, uh, I think, uh, one of the areas where records are really fundamentally crucial. Uh, another one of our members wrote, I know more about Captain Cook than I know about my family. Uh, he's an 80 year old who lives in New South Wales. And he was describing this genealogical void, uh, this vacuum uh, of information that's common to many of us. Leonie Sheedy, who's our CEO and founder of Clan, talks about being a parentless family. And she said, I have no sense of belonging to a long line of extended relatives. No parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, second cousins. My loss is also my children's loss as they have no extended relatives on their mother's side either. I feel that I have no past that my life only began as a three-year-old. Yeah. And so, and, and many of us were ushered out of, uh, out of home care um, still very confused about our place in the world, um, confused about why we were there in the first place. I was in an orphanage, but I knew I had parents. They used mm. to come and visit a couple of times a year uh, for the 11, 12 years that, uh, that I was in care. So in a sense, the search for identity and family and connection to family and so on uh, requires us to start again. And what better place to start than in the records that have been kept about us, made about us. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. actually have used the, the term of, uh, storehouse of hope. Mm. Sorry, Kirsten. Mm. Did you well, I was to... just going to say, I think as well, it's important to remember that even though there are these records relating to people's childhoods who grew up in out-of-home care, they're not the same as the, the normal family records that would have been created under different circumstances, that they are created by the organisations about yeah. the children. They're not. They're not by the children or by those families. Um, yeah, which is quite a different um, childhood record, I guess. You you might actually think uh, that um, care leavers actually start with an advantage, because somebody <laughs> where has has collected all these childhood records 
about us. And all we have to do is go and get that and we'll understand our childhood. <laughs> that's that's the, uh, the metaphor of the storehouse of hope. Um, mm. But so often that store that hope is dashed because what we find in the records is not at all uh, like we expected. Um, mm. We expect to have some sort of narrative that made sense that would tell us who we belong to, um, who we who belongs to us, um, you know why we were there, uh, why we couldn't. Uh, leave and rejoin our families if we had them and so on. So there's a very great sense of uh, being let down by the records um, and, and one hopes that um, current uh, administrators of out-of-home care actually learning something from from the terrible letdown that many of us older ones had where yeah. we simply uh, didn't find what we expected to find in the records. We found all sorts of things we didn't expect, and that's equally uh, traumatic, really. A lot of um, language which is offensive, uh, descriptions of ourselves or our parents or the people we belong to, or siblings and so on, terribly, um, terribly uh, negative and offensive, sometimes gratuitously so. You know, girls being called sluts and, uh, you know, um, gutter snipes and the like. Uh, that kind of language um, is very common in some of the records that we do dis uh, discover. Um, lots of omissions. Uh, you, you'd expect to find medical information, and many of us want to have that because, you know, I can't remember what injections I had. I've got some mm. scars on my arm, so I must have had something, but there's nothing in my records about my medical um, um, experience except that I was free of syphilis when I was two and a half years of age. <laughs> and and uh, also I didn't suffer from epilepsy. Uh, that's the only medical information that, that, I, that I could find. And many of us complain about the lack of that sort of basic information. Um, and one of, the, one of the other things that uh, we do find uh, a lot of uh, care leavers say, and I found this particularly the, the case too, in my own records, is that there's no no sense of the voice of the child in the records. Mm -hmm. My yes. voice is not found in the records. So things that happen to me, uh, like my father being one day uh, warned that he wouldn't be able to visit us if he upset us. Um, I wasn't upset, and I would have I would have said I would be more upset if he didn't visit us. But I didn't ever have the opportunity to say any of that. And there are lots of uh, children who, who would have liked to uh, now, as adults, mature and sometimes old age adults, uh, say, "I would have liked my point of view about that mm. incident to be recorded." Yeah. And even on on such uh, practical matters as as uh, abuse, abusive treatment, sexual or physical abuse, um, people uh, people expect to find that their mm. abuse is recorded if they reported it. And it's hardly ever reported, but certainly that's an opportunity. That would have been an opportunity for the child to write something, or at least to have something recorded about mm. what happened to them, and so on. They, people expect to see that, and they're yeah. shattered when when it's not there. So yeah. when they apply for redress, for example, there's very little uh, information which they can use to make their case for redress. That's very important yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's definitely the case that the records are written for about the children, not with any interaction or information with the children as well. Um, we might need to move on in the interest of time um, to looking at some of the issues around um, records access um, and issues of privacy and reduction, because that's obviously a massive one in this space. So, um, Nicola, I'll let you talk about this. Or is Simon able? Is Simon coming on? Simon is here, so we can oh, include him into the conversation now as well. <laughs> Welcome, Simon. Hi, how are you? Hello, Simon. Good. Hello, Frank. Many apologies, major technical difficulties this morning. <laughs> Excellent, you can also join us. Um, so we were just moving on to discussing the main issues um, with records access, including privacy and redaction, the contents of records, 
um, and complex access processes. Frank, do you want to start by describing the issues around privacy and reduction? Yes, yes, and uh, again, um, I, I, I hasten to say that I think things have improved uh, mm. quite a bit in recent years. But in the time when I started getting my records, that's in the middle of 19, 1990s, um, redaction, um, that is blacking out or whiting out, uh, depending on which state you lived in, was very common. And, and um, looking back on it now, some of it was very silly. Um, there's a there's a, a one letter that my mother wrote, only one ret letter she ever wrote, and half of it is blacked out because it referred, I finally found after uh, nearly a decade of, of chasing that particular letter, it was so precious to have that one letter written in my mother's handwriting, I found out what was missing from that um, that missing paragraph. And it was a story about my brother being sent out on a farm and not getting wages. And my mother complained about that. We knew that. <laughs> we, we all knew that story. Um, it was absolutely pointless to say, well, because it was about another person, your brother, oh. uh, you can't have that information because that's his personal information. And I think that's that um, that issue of personal information, how it's defined in terms of your relationship to the family, which is really at the nub of this problem. So is information about my mother only her information or is it also my information? Because she's my mother. Is the information about my brothers my personal information? Where do you draw the line and say, well, you know, uh, I, I, again, I would probably want to go back to the normal family, put normal in inverted commas always, um, go back to the normal family. Nobody says, well, you can't know about your sister. She lives in the same house as you, but uh, you can't know what she's up to. Surely, surely there's a, a, a line at which uh, some of the people who redacted information of that kind crossed, which is beyond common sense. Mm. So um, information about uh, uh, your, your family, sometimes information about the people you grew up with. I mean, in, in the orphanage I was in, I had two brothers, but they were older than me, so we were separated. I was actually closer to some of the children of my own age. And in a sense, I see them as my siblings and I want information about them from time to time. Um, and I have to go through this reduction stuff about, you know, it's their personal information and we'll have to contact them and so on. I think all of that, that stuff was, all of that uh, FOI and privacy principles and so on were developed in a different era uh, for different purposes to do with government, uh, um, government transactions in the commercial and business sphere and so on. Um, I really do think that uh, out of home care records are in a class of their own and should have separate rules. And indeed we've got, uh, we've got plenty of advice about how that should operate. Uh, through the Royal Commission recommendations and the uh, DSS uh, guidelines and principles, which you know make common sense to me. I think that's a, a great point that we might bring Simon in on. Simon, are you able to comment about how tools like the Privacy Act can help or hinder in these situations in regards to reduction and privacy? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, certainly I can. Uh, and sorry, I have to apologise. I was meant to be operating off a tablet today and I'm on a, now sat on an iPhone so um, we'll see how we go um, but I think you know Frank talk, uh, has mentioned some really good points around uh, around privacy and around FOI and they are both um, very bureaucratic processes aimed at dealing with bureaucratic records and I think what we fail and, and particularly for larger institutions and and, and government generally we we generally fail to, to consider what we're dealing with as, a, as personal. And, and these types of records are extremely personal. They're not, they're not bureaucratic records. And we, we, seem, we, we have a tendency to dehumanize the process and to dehumanize the records. Um, so, and, and that's, um, that's both a result of, I guess, the sort of risk averse nature of, of governments. Um, and it's also, um, I guess, a, a um, 
a flow on effect of having these overly bureaucratic mechanisms like FOI, where people are forced to access records about themselves through those processes. So in, a, in an ideal world, agencies and organizations who are dealing with um, records such as those from out of home care leavers, um, they, they, my, my advice would be that they look at putting in place mechanisms to provide access outside of FOI. Um, yeah. that, that doesn't mean to say that they, can't, they don't have to then consider some of the privacy issues around that, um, but at least it, 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 by t removing it from the FOI process, you, you actually have an opportunity to, to bring the human element in and to consider individuals on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, as Frank mentioned, some of the some of the examples that we've heard of in terms of the impact of, of privacy is where, you know, people have been provided photographs of their school class and all of the all of the faces have been scratched out of the kids who they went to school with. And, and the yeah. reason given for that was privacy. Um, that's that's utterly rubbish you know um and 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 that's and that's that fear of doing the wrong thing it's that dehumanized element of the process um and and i, and I think people tend to just fall back on privacy and say oh yes we can't release this because it's because of privacy when they don't actually understand what privacy means or what the management of personal information means so there's a lot of education and cultural change that needs to happen across large organizations um, to get them to understand that yes, privacy is a factor, um, but it should never it should never be used as a blocker to providing information to people of this in this these sort of circumstances. Um, and uh, you know, I do think that as you know, Frank made a really really good point about the fact that um, records relating or records for out of home care leavers, uh, where they include information about their parents or siblings that is um th there's a really strong argument there to say that that information is the applicant's personal information just as much as it is that of the person's um so one of the, one of the things that we're trying to do here in south australia in fact is to make um we're fairly fortunate that we don't ha actually have privacy legislation here we have um, a, a policy instrument that that directs state government agencies around privacy um, and so what we're trying to do is actually to make some changes to that, um, th those privacy principles and the privacy policy here that allows for the sharing of that sort of third party information to applicants and actually gives, gives agencies a mandate to do so. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Simon. And I think you pick up, there's some excellent points in there I just wanted to highlight. And, and we do go into more detail about this in the toolkit. One is, I think, to yeah, in in terms of taking a more human approach to privacy, or a you know, slightly more sensible approach to privacy, is to remember that there's no point redacting stuff if the person was there. So, like the example of the yeah school photograph, we've all got school photographs, you know, of our showing our classmates. We were there for those photographs. Um, people who grew up in out of home care were there for the photographs that were taken of them. I I personally can't see the point of yeah redacting stuff when the person was there and may have memories of it anyway. And the second point I wanted to just highlight was the fact that all organisations do have a choice about how they want to release records. Um, I think for a lot of agencies, government agencies in particular, um, there's this notion that they are obliged to go through an FOI process, like that's the only way that they can release records. And I think um, what is really clear in this space is that, yeah, agencies can decide to not go through that process and have an informal process. And that can, yeah, make the whole thing more human really quickly. So yeah, just wanted to jump in on that, I guess. Yeah, on that point, uh, Kirsten, the, the leadership in this area is clear. I mean, we've had uh, we've had a guideline from New South Wales, uh, Information Commissioner. We've had a, a, a policy discussion paper from Victorian uh, Commissioner of Information and and other people they're, they're all saying go informal you don't yeah, need yeah. to go through the bureaucratic processes these are kids who grew up in your care or the care yeah. of the organization you're now working for uh, just treat them as people who need information and you've got yeah. the information why keep it back from them yeah. I mean I keep I keep asking that question when I when I meet obstructive people why are you holding on to my information? Why can't yeah. you just give it to me? 
<laughs> it's no use to you anymore. Yeah. It might be useful to historians, perhaps, who want to do academic research, but, but you know, just give me my information. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, sorry to move us on. I'm just really conscious of time and we still have a lot to cover. So we might move on now to discussing the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. As Frank mentioned already, um, that the Royal Commission did look at records and record keeping as, as part of its, you know, it had a very wide mandate, but as part of it, it did, it did look at records and record keeping. And the final report, um, volume eight, was about um, record keeping and information sharing. So again, the toolkit goes into detail about these record keeping recommendations. Um, and I will say as well, these record keeping recommendations in a lot of cases mirrored recommendations from previous inquiries, you know, going back to bringing them home, forgotten Australians, the former child migrants inquiry. The same issues and the same recommendations are coming up again and again. Um, but to um, talk to Simon, maybe in the first instance, do you want to talk about how the CARA agencies have responded to the Royal Commission record keeping recommendations? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kirsten. And, and I agree with you wholeheartedly that, um, you know, the things that are raised in that Royal Commission are, are nothing new for people who've been in and around the record keeping industry. You know, we have 20, 25 plus years of recommendations from various inquiries that all pretty much say the same thing, that records are really important and that we need to do better. Um, so from a, from a CARA perspective and, and, um, in talk, and I guess in talking about the the response from various jurisdictions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk obviously about the, the, the government record keeping and archival authorities as opposed to the, the, the maybe church based or, or whatever it might be, but certainly from the, from the government side of things, um, all of the jurisdictions put in place disposal freezes on records of relevance as soon as the Royal Commission commenced. Um, and I think that was really important, just uh, not only practically did it ensure that records weren't destroyed that might be relevant, um, but it's, I think those disposal freezes send quite a powerful message to um, our government agencies about the importance of these records, uh, not only to themselves, but also to, to the applicants and, and the people who are invested in the Royal Commission. Um, there was also um, a, a lot of liaison between CARA and our working groups in the Royal Commission. Um, there's a, a paper submitted on the matters relating to record keeping and some of the things in that paper came out in the, in the recommendations. Um, so as you mentioned, the, 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 I guess the first five recommendations uh, in volume eight of the report um, are fairly specific to government organisations and then they start to move on to the, into the education sector and, and, and around information sharing. But those, those first five recommendations, um, recommendations 8.1 and 8.2, are very much around the retention of records and the need for agencies to um, retain records for at least a minimum of 45 years. So all, all authorities have responded to that and they've amended existing disposal authorities or they've put in place new disposal authorities to ensure that at least at a minimum rec those types of records are retained for 45 years across their jurisdiction. In many instances, um, jurisdictions have actually gone above and beyond that, either in terms of keeping those types of records for longer um, or in um, the case of South Australia, for instance, and a, and a couple of other jurisdictions, we've actually increased the scope of um, the disposal authority so that it doesn't just relate um, to children, it actually re relates to all vulnerable people. Um, and we've also increased it so that it doesn't just relate to child abuse um, or sexual abuse, sorry, but it relates to abuse of any type of nature. So whether that's um, physical, mental, financial abuse. So um, we're hopefully capturing a, um, a lot more uh, of a broad, brush of records that might be relevant to people uh, who've experienced uh, and been on the receiving end of, of government policies and government services of that nature. Um, and that was done with one eye to knowing that there are Royal Commissions into aged care and disability and the like as well that are currently going on and chances are we're going to see the same recommendations over and over again. Um, recommendation 8.3 um, relates to or re recommends that um, uh, 
guidance and advice be published that's, that's usable by both government and the non-government sector. Um, so CARA have actually done that. We've, we've got a working group that worked through those issues and that guidance has been produced and is available on the CARA website for agencies and all non, you know, for government and non-government jurisdictions to look at. Um, many, uh, many jurisdictions have got links to that from their own websites and some have also um, tweaked that guidance to be specific to their jurisdiction as well. Um, so um, for, for agencies, for them, whilst, you know, from a legislative point of view, we might only uh, be mandated to provide advice and, and policy direction to, to government agencies within our jurisdiction, um, the guidance was written in a way that it, it can be picked up by non-government organisations as well. Um, and that guidance also then really uh, picks up on recommendation 8.4, which was around the principles. Um, and we strongly support those principles that were included in the um, in the report. Um, again, they're not um, uh, they're not unlike principles that we've seen from other reports um, and other um, reviews. Um, they, in most instances, they um, match the principles that we abide by anyway, in terms of rec good record keeping and archival standards. Um, and so there has been a bit of work done in the jurisdictions to um, make sure that they're more, uh, that, you know, that the, the, the work we're doing is, is linked quite closely to those recommendations. I know that National Archives, for instance, maps their information sta management standard principles to the principles um, that came out of this Royal Commission. And so there's other pieces of work that, that, that have been done around the country. Um, but that guidance, that guidance material that I talked about at recommendation 8.3, that includes those principles and embeds that in the advice that we provide, not only to government, but also to the non-government agencies. Thanks, Simon. Um, yes. I was just going to say, that might be a good point to move us on to kind of more generally talking about what agencies can do to improve access. That's all right. <laughs> Because um, one of the key aspects of the toolkit is information and practical tips and tools um, to assist organisations in improving access to these records. Um, so a lot of the section of the toolkit is around the guidelines that Frank's already mentioned, the Department of Social Services guidelines, and obviously bringing in all those recommendations from inquiries of the Royal Commission that Simon's just gone through um, for us. So, Frank, you were, you were involved in the development of the guidelines originally. Why is it so important for organisations to use them? Well, I think um, it goes to a point I mentioned just a moment ago, and that is that while there are while there are um, there are uh, liberal, gener generous uh, approaches from leadership often about access to records, actually at the coal face, it depends on who you get sometimes. Who, who actually is deciding on your record. So I think it's important that people understand that uh, uh, that the leadership is actually on the side of the person asking for the records. Uh, and, and you're not going to get into too much trouble if, you, if you're generous and kind hearted in supplying all the records without reductions, uh, redactions. And people need to understand that, uh, that, that the rules of the game are actually um, in favour of the applicants, um, and so guidelines are important to to help people through. I think of those uh, DSS guidelines, which talk about third party, for example, third party redactions. Um, they're quite clear and specific indications of where you draw the line at uh, a breach of privacy and where you don't. I think that that should be i'm not sure it is but i th think it should be a, a very very useful uh tool for people uh, uh, making decisions about uh releasing records so you know, i just think um there is so much that is good in the rhetoric in the yes. literature that is available to record holders and people making decisions about uh, access um i just wonder why it takes so long for the the actual person making the decision uh, to to get to understand. Yeah. Uh, I say, to people, you know, if, if, if Simon mentioned risk averseness, and I think that's a really important point. Uh, I say to people, I've been in this business now for nearly 25 years. I have never heard of one single case 
of anyone getting into any difficulty because they released personal information to someone incorrectly. So all that fear um, that you're, you're taking a real risk with your career or something um, just seems to me to be nonsense. Yeah. So the um, guidelines are good and the practices needs to follow it. <laughs> Yeah, I think, and I think that that's yeah definitely one of the reasons why we've created this toolkit in the hope that people, it'll be another avenue that people can access to get that guidance on practice rather than it just being in literature and things. Um, Simon, I know you've mentioned when we've spoken before that it isn't always the archives that provides the access to records. Um, how do you think we can still influence best practice in records access? when it isn't us providing the access um yeah that i, I think that's a that's, it's a really that's a really difficult thing to do um, and some of it goes back to what frank and i have talked about previously and it's about affecting that cultural change so it's actually getting people to to, to understand um the importance of um of what they're considering um and to have that and to and and i really guess to, to come at it from um you know with a, a sense of empathy um, and and understanding of the the importance and the value of the records to the individual. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in the process of saying, you know, I've got this record in front of me. Let's have a look at these twenty exemptions and how how can I exempt it from release? Um, when you when you really need to think about, okay, well, what is the impact? What is the value and the impact going to be? And I and, and like Frank Frank alluded to, I can guarantee that the the value of releasing the records far outweighs the risk of not um so i, I think you know i, I would um, support um uh, a pro release approach as opposed to a, a pro exemption pro redaction um approach there are some um there are some very i guess some practical things that agencies can do though um some of those things are around process and some of them are around the sort of human element so from a process perspective you can um, approach this type of access outside of FOI, as we've spoken about before. That's quite a, a, a simple thing to do. You can put in place a, a very easy and simple administrative scheme. Understanding what records you hold um, so that you can actually then identify which records may be of value to the individual and also then help them with records that they might not be aware of. Um, so as, as Frank spoke about right at the start when I came in a bit late, it's not just the person's case file that's important, um, it's all of the other records that might provide context and history about that person and the organisation. So understanding that you've got those records and where they might be and how to access them is also important. Um, for a lot of individuals as well, they've, they've spent a lot of time trying to track down their information. So being able to respond in a timely fashion is, is really valuable. And just, you know, understanding that um, these people might, you know, if you work in an institution that has provided care services, these the people who are coming to you may not want to have to deal with you, and but they've got to to get access to their records. So being, you know, being empathetic, be, responding in a timely manner, um, make, making the process a human process as opposed to a, a step process, um, all help um, the individual get the results that they want. Yes, thank you, Simon, that was great. Um, and Frank, as we just discussed before, the way records are released may have been difficult for people in the past. Now, you've seen a lot of records releases, um, and I was just wondering if you could talk to some of the features that make a good records release. Yes, I, I think we again we're, we're learning, um, and record holders are, are learning uh, from mistakes of the past. In in the past, you often just got a, a, a bundle of uh, records, photocopied, sometimes really badly photocopied, uh, in an envelope, and and uh, you were left with them, and so. Uh, I, for example, I didn't understand some of the language. I didn't understand what it meant to be boarded out. I don't remember being boarding and boarding with a family. Uh, I've since learned that boarding out meant really fostering. Uh, I didn't know what committed meant uh, until I learned about going to the ch children's court and being charged with the offence of being a neglected child. I didn't know what um, disposal of the child meant. Um, 
there's, there's a lot of that sort of language in the, the records, which, uh, you know, a good a good um, person uh, providing a service and, uh, would support the the applicant with explaining those terms, you know, and, and running through them with them so that in plain language they can understand. Oh yeah, that was when you were fostered out to that that foster mother. That's what boarding out means, and so on. I think it's simple things like that. The other thing that uh, I noticed when I got my files, and lots of people until fairly recently experienced this, they just got them willy-nilly as they were photocopied, apparently. There may have been a system in, in the house, but we couldn't, the recipients couldn't, couldn't see it. These days, the good supporters are actually making a story out of the records. They're putting them in chronological order, you know, the first days through to the last days, so that you can follow a story through. And, and also providing some, some kind of genogram at the beginning, which actually explains who's who um, in, the, in the records. So when somebody's mentioned, uh, you can look at the first uh, introduction and see, oh yeah, that's that person. Uh, a lot of people don't know their birth parents, um, and they certainly, they, many people are learning that they've got siblings through the records. So mm -hmm. Having having some sort of uh, uh, chart or a genogram of some sort, uh, I think, is very useful. And I think um, it's a mark of respect that you don't send them out in a bl plain brown envelope anymore. That you actually make something nice of them, put them in a nice folder. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not suggesting decoration for decoration's sake, but you're showing respect if you actually present them in a respectful sort of fashion. Those are simple little things that people are, best practice people are doing now routinely and good luck yeah. to them for doing that. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a really interest, a uh, really important point is that these are like quite simple steps that an organisation can do to, to vastly improve how the records are received by the recipient. You know, you mentioned getting black and white, um, you know, copies of records. You know, we would encourage organisations to provide high quality colour copies, you know. Um, yeah, putting them in a nice folder, um, telling the person when they're going to be, you know, sent out or asking the person how they want to receive them. Like, I, I think all of these things are, yeah, little steps that organisations can do with, like, not much extra effort on their part. Um, and I wanted to highlight as well that in this space, there are lots of support organisations available. Um, you know, it can be a bit overwhelming for, a, for an archive to, you know, suddenly make these changes and, and think about what it means for their work. But you know, organisations such as CLAN and the Find and Connect support services and LinkUp, they're all very experienced is assisting people through this records access process. And so one of the things we talk about in the toolkit is that archives and record holders have um, information available about these organisations. So the person, the requester can decide, do they want to interact with the record holding organisation or do they want to instead go through a support service and get them to help them? So yeah, there are, more options I think available today as well about how people can go through that records access process. Gosh, looking at the time, um, just to highlight some of the documents we've been talking about today. So the Department of Social Services Access to Records by Forgotten Australians and Former Child Migrants um, contains both access principles and then best practice guidelines. If you haven't looked at that document, would highly, highly recommend it as we've all sort of talked about, it really steps you through a records access process and, and helps that decision making process. Um, CLAN has a Charter of Rights to Childhood Records, which again, if you haven't seen, would really um, encourage you to have a look at, because I think that's an important, um, it sets out what care leavers want in this space. And I think that's really important for, for people to to know and acknowledge as well. And um, yes, the recent guidance issued by the New South Wales Privacy Commission are talking about informal release outside of legislated processes. And yeah, we've seen a discussion paper in Victoria as well. And there, there is definitely a move towards those, using those more informal processes for that um, purpose. So yeah, just if you haven't looked at those um, already, would encourage you to, to have a look at those documents. Okay. so. Um, I think we've had a great discussion so far on the importance of out-of-home care records and the continued need to improve access to these records. Um, it's been a pretty whistle-stop tour through these issues, so um, I hope you managed to keep up with us all. Um, but we hope it's given you an understanding of why this new online course on out-of-home care records has been developed 
Um, the course is covering these five areas of the history of child welfare in Australia, record keeping issues for records of out of home care, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, um, the importance of contextual records, and then a really large section on providing access to these records. Um, the, sorry, there we go. So the course has videos with experts in throughout. We've got six experts in this course. Um, we've got the great Frank as one of them. We've got Caroline Carroll, um, who is the president of the Alliance for Forgotten Australians. We've also got Leonie Sheedy, who is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Care Leavers Australasia Network. We've got Eth Ethna Donlan, who um, was the manager of the records and coordinated support and regional outreach teams at Open Place Victoria, which is one of the support services that Kirsten was just mentioning before. Uh, we've got Michaela Hart, a senior archivist who works in this space for the Department of Health and Human Services Victoria. And we've got Barbara Reed, who's director of record keeping innovation, who um, was heavily involved in the creation of the DSS guidelines. So we've got a fantastic mix of experts there who help you along the way. So the online course is called the Out of Home Care Records Toolkit. It is available now through the ASA's online learning platform. We do encourage you to do the full course. This is um, by no means a substitute for actually taking the course. It takes about three to four hours to complete. It's self-directed. You can start and stop at any time you need to. There's quizzes and activities to get you thinking about these things for your organisation. Um, and yeah, the, the idea is really to support archivists and record holders to understand the needs of people who grew up in out-of-home care and how to provide access to records in this space in a safe and empathetic way. Um, so I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> so we hope you've all um, been able to follow along with all of that. So please, if you've got any questions, write them, write them in the box now. Um, so we do have a question already, so we can start off with that. Um, so Tracy Bradford says, and I'm just going to lean forward so I can actually see my screen. So sorry, everybody. Um, I would be very interested to hear from the panel on the importance and validity of oral information as a source of information when considering and dealing with requests for access to records. So I don't know, uh, Frank, maybe if you want to start off on that one and Simon, you can come in. Yes, there's 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 a, a great deal of work going on. Well, I call it work, but I, that's probably wrong. There's a great deal of activity happening around oral work. Um, just as Indigenous people have a, a sort of an oral tradition of storytelling, I think a lot of care leavers uh, uh, favour that approach too. Uh, a lot of storytelling, a lot of uh, personal accounts being written uh, as well as 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 uh, being told in meetings and, and uh, uh, reunions and the like. Very, very important uh, aspect. And it's there quite often that you'll find that people say, I've got my records, but I don't recognize myself in it. I want to tell my side of the story, if you like. Uh, so very, very important. We, we, we know that memory is not always perfect, but you know, um, to discount memory because it is, <laughs> oral and, and a long time after the event um, is not necessarily a, a, a great idea. You can get some really important insights into people speaking about their story, even if they're telling a story that's 60 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the thing that, that uh, strikes me often when I hear people talking about uh, their childhood memories is, why have they remembered those things? There's obviously something that's very important in their childhood that they've hung on to for all that time, and they want to tell that that story. So I, I think it's really uh, vitally important that we capture as many stories as we can. You know, it might be important to transcribe them and get them uh, made available in written form because it takes a long time to listen to oral histories, <laughs> uh, and you've only got so much time to do that. So, and CLAN has been doing quite a lot of that work. Uh, we've been interviewing care leavers and publishing uh, their stories in written form in our newsletter. Uh, and, you know, it, it so often triggers others. That's the other ele element of it, that uh, so many stories are similar, or mm. there are similar themes coming through the stories. 
So yeah, I'm a, I'm a great fan of oral work. Uh, Simon, did you want to come in on this as well? Did you have any comments to add? Uh, yes, um, I think, I mean, just picking up on what Frank said, I, I agree also that sort of oral histories are, are very important and are, are probably a very um, underutilised resource within within the sort of history sector. Um, that, you know, there are some people who do a lot of work there, but, but generally speaking, most people will go to the, the written or the visual word and form. Um, uh, I think, you know, from a, from a government perspective, oral histories and oral recordings of accounts on, are not the norm. So they're not the sort of thing that if you spoke to um, a caseworker or a records manager, they're going to automatically think that there should be or that, you know, the, the, the recording or the, if, you know, is an official record or even if a recording exists. Um, <clears throat> but I think just as much as it's important, you know, oral histories can be really important for the care lever. If you're able to under, um, have, you know, have interviews with the people who were the care providers, um, they will often, through that oral history, give um, a very different uh, take on the service than you get through the bureaucratic records, through the minutes and the reports and things like that. You, you, by by getting an oral history, you automatically get that human element, which I think is really important for for um, for the care leavers. Yeah. Um, and I will say as well, um, I think we talk about this in the toolkit, there's been some really great examples of work where if organisations don't have records, they're supplementing the lack of records with doing oral histories with former residents and I think to then share them with other people as well. And I think that's a really um, valuable use of oral histories as well. Yeah. Great. So we have be forgotten too that a lot of care leavers did not have a good education mm. uh, a very poor education in many cases and so you know ask them to write something and they go to pieces but ask them to talk and they'll talk for the next couple of hours like yeah. me <laughs> <laughs> well maybe you can talk to the next question and um, we've had a question about what is the view where a family member does not want their information released to someone else e.g. Um, to other siblings, for example. Yeah, I think that might be one of the rare areas where I would make an exception. If somebody specifically says, I don't want my personal information released to somebody else, uh, you know, you've got a dilemma about overlapping rights. Um, but, at, but at the end of the day, I think I would favour the person who makes that request that it should yeah. be personal and kept confidential. Yeah, and I think the guidelines support that as well. Um, you know, if a person makes a request about records that pertain to them and access in relation to them, then that should be recorded on the file. So if other people try and access those records, yes, people are aware before they release them. There's a related example where somebody says, I don't want my children ever to read my file because yes. it talks about terrible things. I I'm not sure about that one. As a as an historian, I find it really, um, really troublesome to think that a next generation won't be able to see something that was historically constructed. Um, but you know, I can understand the the sentiment. There are a lot of people who who don't tell their children about um, the terrible childhood they have, and they don't want them to find out afterwards either. Um, that's a dilemma. Mm -hmm not easily resolved. No. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the next question. Sorry, let me just. So Nicole Ashby asks, what role should the My Health Record play? Out of home care agencies could gain access and add medical records to My Health Record. I wonder if Simon or Frank, you wanted to comment on that. Simon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, have we lost Simon? We lost Simon. Simon. <laughs> oh dear. We might have lost him. I, it, look, no. I, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm avoiding the question because I don't know enough about my health, uh, except to say that I did not agree to my health records being publicly available. Um, yes. Um, that health records are highly sensitive 
perhaps among the most sensitive records. So I think we've just got to be a bit careful in that area. I think we may have Simon back. Oh no, maybe he's me. Yeah? Yes, I'm back now. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, look, I, I, um, I, I agree with, uh, with Frank there. I, you know, the, the My Health records are um, potentially a significant source of information for, for people, particularly if there are uh, you know, if there's genetic information that needs, or hereditary information that can be passed down from one generation to the next, um, but that type of information, whilst is, you know, obviously falls within the personal category, and within that is is you know extremely sensitive. So, it, um, from my perspective, I think it probably goes back to the question before that that Frank answered um, about where people might not want information released. Um, I think for that sort of information, it's always very important to go to the individual whose information it relates to, um, and to uh, to get their advice and their and to to seek their to uh, seek their views on that because um, there is some information that they may be happy to release, and there might be others that there might be other pieces that are that they want to retain uh, confidential, um, and that should be their right to do so. Um, it's it, you know it's a very very difficult one, but again, I guess for me, it just emphasises the need. Um, to deal with these types of applications for access on a case-by-case -case basis, and not to assume that a single process or a single approach will will you'll be able to deal with everybody in that same way. Okay, thanks everyone. And I know we do have some more questions coming in, so we will try and respond to you via email or something like that because it is two o'clock. So I do want to let people leave on time. Um, so I need to say thank you to my fellow panellists. I think we've had a great discussion squeezed into what feels like a really short space of time for some massive topic. So thank you for joining us and sharing your thoughts on that. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended the webinar. If you're interested in the toolkit, there's a link for more information. This webinar will be available as a recording on the ASA's YouTube account, so you can always come back to it if you um, want to refresh on what we've said during the session. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.